What's going on, everybody? DeMarco and Nano here with another episode of Deadlifts, Dogs, and Dad Jokes. Got a really exciting guest on for you today, a uh, personal trainer, strength coach, kettlebell instructor based out of Ireland uh, named Mr. Finbar Tulin. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I will uh, definitely make sure I get that right the very first time that we uh, that we speak together because uh, our first inter introduction was via messenger, uh, slid into his DMs on Instagram. <laughs> so, but he's actually the kettlebell coach for one of our prior guests, Mr. Kevin Huang. So I'm very excited to talk to him about uh, Kevin's training and what he's been doing. You know, not getting into too much detail, obviously. Don't, don't let his competitors know what he's been up to and figure out the secret sauce. <laughs> but uh, we'd love to talk to him about kettlebells, the Guild of Boys sport, uh, kettlebell sport training, which is obviously very different from the hard style training that I've learned over the last few years. And I'm definitely going to talk to him about his new program that he has out, the Kettlebell Essentials ebook. So uh, really, really sounds like a really good resource. And honestly, I might get it myself. I'm always looking for more resources to learn more about training and strength and in particular kettlebells. It's one of my one of my passions and I'm super pumped. Let's have some fun and learn something new. Hey, DeMarco, how are you? Hey, doing well. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Good man. Good man. How are you keeping? Oh, doing great, man. Doing great. Super pumped to have you on. And I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It is, you go by Finn, but it's your full first name. Is it Finbar? Is that how people pronounce yes. it? Yes. Good effort. Good effort. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be honest on I'm, I'm sure you heard this on the the Kevin Duong episode I, you know, I I tried to make it sound uh like really uh believe it or not uh believe it or not um there's different there, there are definitely different pronunciations of it um wherever you come from in Ireland uh have you, have you ever been to Ireland I have not actually I it's one no. of the few western European countries that I haven't been to I lived in Germany and uh really? went to a countries over there but i haven't yet made it to ireland so it's but it's definitely on my bucket list good man good man no um you probably know this yourself you go to different parts in america and people have a different like twang to their voice or a different like uh, you know what i'm saying exactly. same similar here in ireland um people kind of pronounce your name differently wherever you go but um no no what type of dog what is that a is that what type of dog is that then Oh, this is, uh, so Nano is a, she's actually, she's one of the, we call her a rescue mix, uh, which is okay. the, the here. basically she's probably like some kind of lab, Staffordshire, potentially like a pit bull mix. She's got kind of that uh, kind of blocky head. See so, that there? Uh, yeah. But she's, she's, a big, uh, she's a head on her like a, like a Russian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so she's Girl. but no i know what you mean as far as uh the different the different dialects because in germany where I, where I lived for about 10 years uh there are four different ways that i've heard people say the number two so it's spy spa, spa speed and it's essentially in each of the four kind of corners uh the different areas that border the different countries so it's uh yeah so i definitely know i definitely know what you mean and america <laughs> definitely like that too we have uh what was it like uh what was it like living in germany yeah. Oh man, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. My mom was in the army at the time. So, you know, I was, uh, hanging out, you know, I was, I was, I went to school on a military base, but we lived off post. So I didn't get the full experience. I didn't go to German school or anything, but I did get the chance to learn the language and hang out with a lot of local nationals. And, uh, it was fun. And, you know, I, I was able to, honestly, I'm, I'm sure Irish, uh, culture is similar in this regard. Like we love our beer and our, 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 uh, community and, uh, atmosphere. Like you can, you could pretty much kind of drink whenever like, there's no, you're not getting, if you go to the clubs, it's different because they serve liquor. But if you go to yes. a, a brewery or a pub, uh, you know, or ale house or something like you're, unless you're just a, a, little, a small child, you're probably not 100%. getting your, your, your No, you're 100% right. Germany's yeah. always been so, I've, I've, I've only been to Germany once. I was in Berlin a few years back. Um, absolutely loved it. Uh, okay. Unbelievable city. Um, I'm just really fascinated about, World War Two randomly, um, knowing things like that got there. So I just, just kind of watch movies and watch documentaries and stuff on it. It's really fascinating about that. And uh, it was just kind of strange going there and with the history of obviously that and kind of seeing it all for you no know, for for the first time. And then it's an amazing yeah. city, like very very young and very young and like hipster style city. Yeah. It was very, cool city, cool city. So um, uh, no, I listened to Kev's podcast a week back. He was he's <laughs> he's he's doing good. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, Berlin. Berlin's an amazing city. I mean, they talk about a city that literally rebuilt, you know, themselves after the war. And uh, and it's it is. I agree. It's a very very beautiful city. If you ever get a chance, the the last place in Germany that I lived before we moved back to the states was uh, was Bamberg, 
So it's in the Southern Bavarian region. And it is, uh, it's the really cool thing about it is, is speaking of the war, it was one of the few areas that was actually spared uh, during the Allied bombing. I'm not exactly sure why, I've never actually done the research, but the most of the architecture there is, uh, is original. A lot, a lot of the original old, like very old buildings and um, so, but it's uh, beautiful. There's like, there's a bridge that goes over this river and it's, uh, it's just, I'm sure many, many people have uh, you know, created paintings and drawings of, of the image, but it's, uh, it's definitely, definitely stunning. So, um, you must've been, you must've been, you, you must've been young enough living in, in Germany or were you? Yeah. Yeah. I, so we moved over there when I was, uh, when I was eight years old and then I lived there until I was 18. And then when I turned 18, I came back to the States to, to go to college. So good. Yeah, good, 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 good. I definitely want to go to Ireland though. It's definitely, definitely on my list. <laughs> so yeah. Kev is, uh, Kev's been here a few times, actually. Um, he was, of course, here at the tail end of last year. Um, but I think he, I think he actually done his level one song first start here in Belfast. Nice. Um, I think it was actually. Uh, I'm led to believe it was Phil. I think I'm led to believe it was Phil Squido's last SFG one cert that he had yeah. done before he left song first. Mm -hmm. I was here in Belfast, so I'm really sure Kev flew over from America, but I actually didn't know him at the time, so I knew of him. Obviously, you know yourself within the community, the strength community, the Catabell community. Everybody knows everybody, but oh yeah, um, or you know, you, you have a reference point of somebody. But uh, I do, I do know that he's done a shirt here, um, and uh, he loved it here. He loves it. That's awesome. Did you? Uh, so, did you uh, both connect online, or how did you? How did he end up? I uh, uh, so, uh, so we actually. Um, I think we were actually follow. I think he followed me or whatever else. I'm actually for 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 the amount that I'm on social media, I'm actually not on it that much. If that makes sense, um, yeah. Uh, I I wouldn't be one to sit and scroll or anything like that. Um, it just it bores life in me. <laughs> but uh, and I've probably learned from experience. Probably you're probably the same too. But um, you're just like, what am I doing here? But um, no. So obviously we knew each other vaguely from like the Catabell community and stuff and strong first and that. And then I know Kev has kind of like, um. I know Kev follow, I think I, we both follow each other on social media. And then he, uh, then last year, whenever I um, was like looking for a few people to come on board to my Irish Warrior online catabell program, he reached out. Um, and he just basically said that he was at a bit of a roadblock with his training and felt that he wanted something a wee bit different. He didn't feel like he was, he was like becoming a wee bit stagnant and a wee bit, he needed something a wee bit more fresh, basically. So, um, yeah, so we reached out last year, and uh, it was probably around about the beginning of March, maybe middle of March. He reached out, and um, he's he, uh, he he's been torturing me ever since. <laughs> yeah. But I uh, know he's done really well. Kev's it's been a big difference for him, big change for him. Obviously, um, yeah. I'll go into a wee bit of detail about what catabills and stuff are here, obviously. But um, in terms of GS and that, but obviously he comes from a heavy hard style background, um, yeah. a heavy strength background, but trying to it's total total flip of the coin basically with the way we have him training with the catabell side of things at the minute um because um well the, the irish warrior program is a bit of a i'll go into that in detail too but it's a wee bit of a it's a blend where i combine hard style and catabell sport and my my knowledge and my background and my training experience with that um and in terms of technical ability and some programming ways too and then um he's and then he actually fell in love with it and he's competed i think he's competed four times now he came third last year in the world and stuff against yeah, well, yeah, awesome. against he podiumed he podiumed um against two guys who um are vastly experienced compared to him in terms of kettlebell sport um sport you know you're you, i don't know if you've competed in a sport yourself but when it comes to sports uh you can never replicate experience you just can't replicate that you know sure. um, yeah. especially whenever you're on the platform or you're in competition you just can't beat that um yeah. you may get that you may sometimes get beginner's luck um but uh kev was up against it against two um i think he was against the polish guy one polish guy who is um the world record holder at his weight category kev actually only came about a couple hundred points behind him which is very very good and then I think, I think this guy who came first was a, was a Spanish guy who basically set the highest total of that week. So, you know, you're up against it right away against that. So even out, he, he done his best. He did the, the refer to him. Um, he medaled. Um, and it was a big it was a big learning experience for him. Um, but uh, this year's this year's year, he'll do well this year. I, I definitely I definitely believe that because he's definitely got he's got a lot of experience under his belt, both kettlebell training ways, um, 
GS technique ways, uh, and also um, his, his total output and his strength and his strength and endurance has vastly increased. His work his work capacity has all increased, and he's in, he's going to be in a much better place. It was a big challenge because he was he came from obviously a big horse day background, and the technical nature of GS is vastly different to horse day and vice versa. So trying to like uh, weed out some of the bad habits or there were good habits obviously in Hardsdale but they're not really going to be beneficial in any way whatsoever for yeah. GS so um, but no he's, he's doing good he's doing good yeah no absolutely man I, and I, I saw I saw his post I saw your post talking about him and, and definitely clicking over him which is great because that shows that you're very obviously very passionate about his performance and his development but yeah I agree that is impressive considering he'd only been training that style for what about seven or eight months and he, and he got third place. That's, that's amazing. Uh, and it's, uh, very different. it's very different. And you know, like I have you, you, um, did you go through the strong first system? Did you get it? Yes, I did actually, believe it or not. Yes, I did. Uh, I certified yeah. strong first in 2013. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 2000, right, 2000, 2013, I, I, I certified with strong first. Um, and I, I was a hard style head, um, for a number of years. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was just, I, I level one, strong first level one. Um, I've done the level two about, I think four or five times. Uh, I've done the barbell sort a number of times. The only one I didn't do was the bodyweight sort because the, be, between me and you, I found a bit of an air money racket, to be honest. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, no, I know, trust me. I, I know exactly what you mean. It, it gets, yeah, yeah, it just, it gets it just doesn't, you, you know, um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, strong first. Yes, I've, I've came from a heavy background within strong first. Yes, yeah, well, that's I mean, and so you know, just like I do, that it's different, you know, in the gym versus on, on the on the stage. You know, it when we when I did my practice snatch tests, you know, at the gym with my coach, you know, I just warmed up, I'm fresh, I feel good, and there's not there is some pressure, there's always going to be some kind of pressure to perform well in front of your coach, but it's very different versus doing your snatch test in front of your entire class. You know, yeah. or Kev, like competing, you know, on on a on an international stage, you know, and it's uh, very that's that's it's like funny when guys are like, oh, I could I could have made that catch, or I I could have I could have scored that goal, uh, you know, look how easy that was, and it's like, dude, you didn't have a hundred thousand people screaming uh, your name, you know, th- throwing you f bombs, like cussing you out, throwing, <laughs> that in the stadium, like very different, uh, very different, uh, you know, that pressure, that pressure is definitely different, so. Um, but that's really cool. So the first time I saw GS, I, I had just got done with strong first, uh, with my SFG one. And I'm like, Oh yeah, man, I, I'm, you know, beating my chest. I know everything there is to know about kettlebells. Uh, you know, naively, naively. I thought that of course, <laughs> uh, and then I thought I saw a guy doing a GS snatch and I was like, what the hell is this? This looks like some weird, like movement. This is wrong. His heels are coming up. You know, he's rotating his body. Like that's not, that's not the right way. That's gotta be a fail. Um, and then obviously I learned more talking to more coaches and, and, and realized this is a whole different world in the kettlebell universe. So it's, um, it's neat. So if you, if you had to say, you can get like the cliff notes version, if you will, what would be the, the primary difference between say hard style, which most people probably start with in their kettlebell journey and the cuter board sport. So are we rolling here on this actual podcast a minute, by the way? Oh yeah. Oh, we're good to go. And I did, I forgot to tell you this. I did an intro about you before this. So yes, we are live. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So you'll add this out, can I? (laughs) Yeah. So obviously in kettlebell training, you have, you have two primary disciplines. You have horse day kettlebell training and you have gear voice board kettlebell training. Each of these two disciplines offer a very unique and uh, differing approach and trade off. The best analogy that I like to use to differentiate horse style from gear voice sport is to differentiate sprinting and jogging. Now, I know that can be very common and very easy, but in my opinion, it's the best way for to break it down in the layman's terms. So in horse style technique like sprinting, it is basically about attempting to recruit muscle and energy to create the most force output possible for each individual rep. In gear voice sport technique, it's a bit like jogging it's about conserving strength it's about conserving energy uh, endurance um to go for a longer period of time example five to ten minutes in one set basically so as as i've been diving deep into the education and practice for both disciplines for many years i'll give you a brief description um, and understanding of 
of both in, in my terms or in my opinion. So let's talk about hard style kettlebell training firstly. So the term hard style does not refer to its difficulty, nor, as many believe, does it refer to solely generating tension throughout the body. Hard style really refers to a type of hand-to-hand combat taught in the 70s and 80s by the Special Operations of the Soviet Union in Russia. Yeah, um, and Their training evolved around hard state kettlebell training and fighting because both hard state kettlebell training and fighting refer to schools that meet force of force and physical strength. That's one big ethos and methodology behind Strong First and RKC and basically the hard state kettlebell uh, community. Obviously, hard state kettlebell training was was and has been widely pop- popularized by Pavel Satsalain. Um, but what I am led to believe is that horse day kettlebell training was originally born from the idea that um, the strength and techniques of barbell training can be safely developed with the kettlebell. So, an, or in other words, you can be safely taught the fundamental patterns with the kettlebell to eventually progress to the barbell. Because ultimately, that's what basically horse day was evolved from barbell techniques. Um, uh, to use a kettlebell um, safely. Uh, and from my own experience coaching um, athletes in general population who are starting out their strength journey, I do believe that horse day kettlebell training is a much safer and much effective met- method to help them in- develop their strength and their overall performance and athleticism. Um, and then you have, obviously, horse day kettlebell training, as you're aware, has two basic types. You have one, the ballistic, which is uh, maximum acceleration force in the quick lifts, Swing, snatch, clean, and the jerk. Then you have your grains, which is maximum tension and strength in the slow lifts, like your press, your squat, or your uh, turkey's get up, for example. Um, and horse day kettlebell training basically teaches us to understand the relationship between tension and relaxation. Um, you know that yin and yang relationship between ballistic and grain movements, learning to turn maximum tension on, yet having the ability to, to uh, turn it off at the flick of a switch, basically. So that's basically horse day kettlebell training. Then you have uh, gear voice board kettlebell training. Now, before I go into this, um, I know on your last podcast or one of your last podcasts you had Kev on, and he was trying to give you an explanation of what gear voice uh, sport means. What I'm led to believe, gear voice in Russian means like kettlebell athlete or um, uh, kettlebell. Then you have uh, a gearvik, which is Russian for uh, kettlebell man, and then you have gearvika, which is Russian for uh, kettlebell woman anyway went off on a tangent so uh <laughs> gear voice sport or in other terms is basically it's kettlebell lifting is like weightlifting sport performed with kettlebells so a bit of background on this so competitive kettlebell lifting has a long basic stand in history in russia and many other eastern european countries um the first what, what i'm led to believe from my research that the first official gear voice sport competition was held in the late 1940s in the old USSR, and it developed from there across the 1950s and then the 1960s. Um, and the, this advancement basically came from the military, who used this form of training as part of their strength and conditioning for uh, the, their troops, basically. And then in the uh, 1970s, gear voice sport entered the National Sports Federation as the, the official ethnic sport of Russia. Um, it is predominantly... Uh, it is predominantly, you know, most world records and most world champions across the sport are all from Russia, basically. Um, and it's now a sport that is recognized in over, well, over 80 countries or across the world. Um, but it has been most recently popularized in the UK and Ireland and across, all across America by a handful of, you know, people who are winning world titles and beating these Russians in their own, in their own sport, essentially. Um, the best way to explain gear voice sport is... What I like to refer to as is as endurance weightlifting. So, gear voice sport has two primary disciplines or two primary uh, methods of competition. So, one you have the biathlon, which is comprised of two separate events: the double kettlebell jerk and the kettlebell snatch. The other one, the second discipline, is the long cycle, which is just one primary movement, which combines the kettlebell clean and the kettlebell jerk. So, for example, men complete men can. Com- complete the kettlebell jerk portion of the biathlon and long cycle with two kettlebells while women traditionally use uh, one kettlebell for these events. However, um, that has changed obviously very drastically over the years. Um, you're now seeing more and more women um, are choosing double kettlebell movements. I don't know the whole reason why, but just as an off an off 
shout out to my head here. I think that was obviously because of uh, women's nature, basically. Um, the one that Russians were kind of like, we're not having double bells in this type of thing. But um, uh, but nowadays, like I say, more and more women are choosing the double kettlebell movements, much to, their, much to the benefit and growth of the sport internationally. Um, the kettlebell snatch for both men and women is contested with one kettlebell and the athlete is only allowed to change hands once during the duration of their set. So oh my God, you, really? Yeah, yeah. So you have 10 minutes. Um, you're only allowed oh, to change your hands okay. once uh, without setting the bell down. Um, now, these, the biathlon and long cycle are, are the traditional, you know, primary disciplines. You have many other uh, span-off events, like you have the half marathon, which is 30 minutes of one lift multi-switch without setting the bell down. And you have some sadistic, crazy people doing a full marathon, which is 60 minutes non-stop. In a, in a certain exercise <laughs> without setting the bell down multi switch of course um, but uh, no matter what um, again this may sound obvious but whoever has the hassle the reps is always deemed the champion now the thing about kettlebell sport is that training methodologies vary greatly from athlete to athlete and from coach to coach um, in my opinion DeMarco you know gear voice sport it's a very niche sport um in my opinion, again, it's it's one of the toughest sports on the planet, both physically and mentally. Um, and many of the techniques are different to horse-like kettlebell training, but um, in my opinion, applying a combination of both techniques and disciplines does have the lethal potential of turning you into uh, an extreme kettlebell athlete. Oh, that's, man, that's exciting. And I, I loved that whole uh, segment, by the way, both segments where you, where you went into hard style uh, and, and GS. And it's so funny how, um, you know, or like I said early on, I, I just I, I admitted my own ignorance early on in uh, not understanding it and thinking that this was like the right way versus the wrong way. And you very much, you spoke a bit more, more so as yin and yang. They're, they're both complementary. And, uh, and I, I especially love the idea that you, that you just proposed about uh, incorporating both methodologies into the same program. I think that's, that's actually um, interesting. Not, not to get too much into detail, because again, I don't want to give away the whole farm, so to speak, but for, for like a, an example athlete, of course, Kevin would be an outlier, so let's not use him, but let's say for <laughs> someone who has some background in, in art style, and you would look into their program and incorporate the two, just for a general preparedness standpoint, not for competition, what would it generally look like if you were to incorporate hard style and GS in their program? So obviously it's going to be heavily determined by the person's goal, what yeah. they want to do and what they want to achieve out of this. From my experience coaching people in both, obviously people who come from a horse day background have obviously a very horse day technique and they're, they're always referring to horse day. They're always about trying to create maximum tension, maximum force and using very, very explosive reps. So, the big thing initially would be to change their technique to more of a of a endurance style uh, proponent to complement the the GS style. Um, obviously, when it comes to uh, teaching somebody gear voice board technique, it, it can be quite advantageous to come from a horse day background, and it can be disadvantageous because the advantage of it is is that they'll obviously have a, a vast background and how to and know what to do with the kettlebell. Um, the disadvantage of that is that you're trying to get them out of old habits and as you know probably be, as you know being a coach sometimes you prefer to teach people from a completely blank canvas um, yeah. and sometimes you, you prefer to teach people with a bit of experience and in, in like combining the two of them it's kind of like would somebody would somebody want to train to compete in GS or is somebody just wanting to train for general strength, general endurance, general athleticism. Um, like I said, or lastly, cannabis sports are very niche sport. However, combining the two of them can turn you a bit into a bit of a hybrid style athlete, and you can reap the benefits out of the both out of both worlds. So, if I was teaching somebody from the from the outset, um, GS style, I would usually start with the snatch. Um, again, I'm talking about people from experience here. Uh, if somebody came to me and they'd never been done or they'd never completed kettlebell training, I would obviously teach them hard style first. Um, the reason being it's actually easier uh, and it's more safer initially. And if yeah. they have the prerequisite mobility and strength and overall endurance to go into kettlebell sport, then that's something that if they wanted to, um, I won't force it upon you, but if that's something that somebody wants to do, I will help them in that regard. If it comes to 
the reason I would use the kettlebell snatch initially is because um, one, it's the most enjoyable <laughs> in, a, in a weird way. Plus, um, you can use other kettlebell movements like the press or the double kettlebell front squat or say the double kettlebell swing um, or the kettlebell push press, for example, to complement that. But in reality, it's really down to, it's really down to somebody's goals and aspirations. Do they want to actually do GS or, or do they not? Yeah. Yeah. So you probably find also with your, with your, and, and obviously this is the answer everyone hates to hear is it depends, but it is true. It, it, it depends on a, on a multitude of factors, but do you, do you find that when you, when you, I'm sure a lot of people come to you like, like Kev, they come for that specialized uh, GS style training, but when you find yourself working with, uh, with trainees that are, that are that kind of blank slate and uh, they're just getting into strength training or maybe just getting into, maybe they've done barbell and they're getting into kettlebells or a totally clean site where they don't know, they don't really know much of anything. Do you, do you kind of find early on, so you say you would, for that training, you would start with hard style. Do you find a lot of times that people tend to uh, do well in, in hard style that they're, they're interested in the challenge of GS and just kind of want to learn it because it's different? Or is it typically, I, I like this way because it's, it makes sense to me and I want to kind of stay in this uh, comfortable box if that makes sense it does it does make sense and i'm trying to keep this question or this answer to this question as simple as it possibly can so <laughs> yeah. i know i'm asking these yeah. like dive question. <laughs> <laughs> no so i'll take myself for example um when like i said as i keep saying kettlebell sport is a very niche sport and it is something that Again, I won't force somebody into actually doing, but when somebody comes to me with a goal relative to what they're doing, whether it be in sport or just general health and fit, physical fitness, when I do err on the set of caution, as you're probably aware as a coach, you have to err on the set of caution, um, not only to increase their strength and their endurance potential, but also for, from a safety standpoint, you will you will go into a more hard stay kettlebell training, but when I, I, the reason I, I don't push GS on the people is because it's like, I think about it as my thing. It's like kind of like my dirty secret, so to speak, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't like, and again, as you're a coach, one of the biggest flaws within the industry is that people will force, one, one of the biggest flaws within the industry is that coaches will force their opinion too heavily on their client rather than being realistic or using common sense. I've been and doing my best for that, that person. Yeah. yeah. I've been, I've been so, the, like, I have a vast mixture of clientele. You know, I have people from all walks of life, all different types of athletes, um, uh, medical professionals, teachers. At the end of the day, do I see them guys competing in GS? Not necessarily. Do they see themselves competing in GS? I don't assume so. So, most of the time, they'll come to me for just general health and fitness and general strength goals. And my goal is to get them there in the most safest, the most progressive way possible. Do I feel GS is a way to do that? Probably not. Um, uh, because the time spent getting really good at something, i.e., in this case, a sport, may actually be time wasted getting better at something that's actually going to benefit them it's more in the long run. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. That, and, I, and I love it. I love the fact that uh, even though you, you obviously love the GS training and you're coaching, you're coaching athletes like Kevin in that style. I love the fact that you're, you're willing to take a step back and, and look at the individual and make a decision that's best for that person versus, no, let's turn you into a GS uh, Terminator <laughs> and kill it on stage. So I, uh, I love that philosophy and I, I love the fact that uh, the majority of the coaches that I've had on this show have shared that same sentiment in regards to, you know, serving the person in front of you and, you know, adapting our program to match the person we're serving, not making this person fit into our mold of a program. And uh, and no, and no shade against Strong First. I actually do. I do love. There are plenty of great coaches in the Strong First system. But I there is that is another one of the kind of flaws that I see as well. Is, is it's very much like this is the only way to do it. And uh, I just that's just the more I learn in the industry, the more the more I realize I don't know what I'm doing, and I need to learn more. Uh, and, and be more open minded. So that being said, but, I have I have learned a lot from Strong First, obviously. I, you know, yeah, and likewise, and likewise, tomorrow. But what I but 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 what I will say is, and uh, this is and this is a very important component for people within Strong First to remember because I'm not saying they have a short memory, 
but in some cases people just aren't educated enough to provide an educated or experienced enough to provide an opinion on something. But one thing that they that people forget or maybe they don't know is that Pavel himself has came out and he has said that he has a vast background in kettlebell sport and a lot of the original videos on YouTube yeah. enter the kettlebell. They're all yeah. kettlebell sport techniques that yeah. he's using. I've seen and those. people <laughs> and people forget that. Um, and I totally get what you're saying um, in terms of uh, the whole strong first methodology. I done the level one strong first in 2013 um, and have been associated with strong first right up until 2020 there. But um, and this is an unpopular opinion, but myself after training others and myself with kettlebells from around 2010, um, and I will admit, not bragging or anything, but after logging, you know, thousands of hours online, uh, personal, you know, private personal training and group sessions, I've found that the biggest roadblocks from uh, people seeing results with their kettlebell training is because of two points. And this is number one, people are brainwashed by one training system and one organization. And two, people just don't understand the true meaning of hard, set, hard kettlebell training. On one hand, people will get really nitpicked to death over their technique. They're being trapped into chasing the perfect rep on entry level exercises like the swing, the gobble squat, and the get up. No offense, but you know, people are being told that they need to earn the right to do X, Y, or Z exercise. But in my opinion, and also in the opinion of Pavel from the early days, for the best results, you have to move on. Eventually, you have to move on to more productive exercises that actually started the modern kettlebell revolution. And that's the snatch, the clean and press, the push press, the jerk, and the clean. And the reason you move on to them is because when they're performed routinely, they produce immense results in strength, power, and overall endurance. Um, and in this case, with those exercises and with that physical components or those physical components, it's very rare that the Russians are wrong. Don't take a, don't take that out of context, especially nowadays, right now, currently, what's going on. But yeah. um, in, in my case, in, in, in this case, it's very rare that they're wrong. Um, but it's one it's one of the biggest flaws within the industry. You know, if somebody wants to do something, let try your best to get them to where they want to go rather than being nitpicked to death over stupid pre prerequisites that are aligned to an organization or a vision. Um be a bit of a recluse and uh you know help people get to where they want to be in the most safe and, prog and progressive way possible, but don't hold them back because of the stigma of people who are above you basically. No, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I think that, uh, again, I, anytime you, it sounds like you're throwing shade on somebody. It's always, it's always, uh, you know, no one not, not at all, not at all to Marco, because, um, not, not, not at all in the status, because like I say, I believe I can have this opinion and I can back it up because like I said, I have a vast background in horse day catabolism and a fast experience in, 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 in gear voice sport. I have yeah. the accolades to back it up on both. So, and again, I'm not nitpicking one of the one or the other at all. Like I say, I still I still to this day um, utilize both methods in my coaching on a daily basis um, to help people to get the well to get to where they want to be. I have general field athletes um, who play sports. Um, I have uh, I coach people who are in the military, I coach people who are firefighters, uh, and they ultimately just want to improve their overall strength and athleticism and using horse day kettlebell techniques alongside barbell techniques is going to be the on programming ways it's going to be the best way to get them to, to where they want to go i yeah. do have some clientele who come to me um who have backgrounds who have a vast background in kettlebell training but want to actually venture into gear voice sport because they see that they actually or they see and they feel that they want to try something new and then it's my goal and my objective as a coach to get them to where they want to be within kettlebell sport and that is that's ahead of it, really. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And again, I every time you talk, I just I try my best to shut up and just listen because you're, uh, <laughs> you're dropping a lot of awesome wisdom, by the way, and I and I definitely appreciate it. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, uh, especially somebody with a with a wide range of experience in both of those, uh, you know, camps, if you will, uh, both of those disciplines, you have a lot more perspective. You know, that is one thing that I definitely 
Uh, and I've fallen into this trap many times. I feel like we all have, especially when you're first getting started as a coach, you know, you, you, you read one book or you do one seminar and you're like, oh my God, this is the only way to train. You know, I, I read, I, I read uh, and this was before I even did my strong first cert. This would have been back in, uh, actually right around the time you did your SFG one. It was probably 2012, 2013. And I read Dan John's article on T Nation that every single kettlebeller has heard of, the 10,000 kettlebell swing challenge that everyone's probably done. <laughs> And uh, I remember doing in my, I look back at some of my old videos and my technique was just awful. It was basically just an explosive Romanian deadlift uh, with very minimal knee bend. And I was like, a lot of, lot of lumbar activation. <laughs> but, uh, but I remember reading it and thinking, oh my God, the kettlebell swing is this magical exercise. I don't ever need to do anything uh, else ever again, you know? And uh, it's funny how with age and time, of course, and, and experience comes more experience and wisdom. And, uh, but no, I, I think you're, you're at a great place right now. You're, you're objective and you're, you're willing to admit, uh, both the pros and the cons of, um, of a training method in regards to the person that we're speaking of, which of course nuances the, uh, that's the, that's the secret sauce there. So the kettlebell swing is an unbelievable exercise to be fair. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in any way, shape or form, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, running it through the mill here, not by, any stretch and muds, I am a huge advocate of the kettlebell swing. As a matter of fact, I actually prefer. I, I think Dave Whitley quoted this before, or maybe you can you can correct me if I'm wrong. But he was he says kettlebell swings. Kettlebell swings are good, but heavier swings rock. No, very Americanized. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Thought I made that. it. I made of. I made of Bryce that quote to be fair, but it's along those lines that mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do something for high reps. Do the snatch ballistically, you know, or or do the jerk. Just don't do light kettlebell swings, you know. Um, yeah. But in my opinion, and this is this is from my experience again, I find the double kettlebell swing as one of the most forgotten heroes within the horse day kettlebell community. The double, yeah. the double kettlebell swing, what an exercise it is! People don't use it enough. Um, yes, well, you know, it's hard, swings it's are harder. So people don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true as well. You know, yes, <laughs> swings are great. Yes, swings are a great condition exercise, but uh, they're they're also unbelievable for posterior chain, hypertrophy, and strength. For example, a strong, say a strong meal completing many sets of ten plus reps of double kettlebell swings with two thirty twos is without question going to build strength and muscle mass in the hamstrings, glutes, and the spinal stabilizers, um, and they're going to help you build unbelievable explosive strength and power beyond what one kettlebell can bring. So, in my opinion, do more double kettlebell swings. <laughs> it's so funny you should say that because I uh, I hate double. Well, I say not hate. Hate's a strong word, but I definitely oh, get you, get you. would much rather do either a heavy two arm swing or a heavy single arm swing opposed to double bell. Uh, in particular, did you have you you obviously you know Phil from from the strong first days and. RKC days back in the day. Have you gone through the Deviate uh, program? Or I'm not sure if you have or were planning to or not. Um, no, yes, I have actually. Um, me and Phil me and Phil first met back in, let me guess, I think it was around 2018 before COVID and the world just completely yeah. went into lockdown or for a long period of time. It was around 2018 when obviously he was heavily, heavily associated with Strong First. Um, I'm not going to the whole, you know, background of all what happened. There, oh, yeah, but, um, we can see that. But, for, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll save that for another time. But, uh, uh, but in 2018, Phil was he was the master. He's he was obviously a master instructor for Strong First. He um, was looking after um, Ireland, so he was the master instructor for Ireland at the time. And there was a cert, the cert that Kev done in Belfast. Uh, Phil was the master instructor at that, um, but. It was originally due to be held in my gym uh, and Phil came over to Belfast many months before the actual certification to get a feel for the place and to meet all of the instructors within Ireland and so forth. And yeah. cut, the, cut the long story short, you know, me and Phil became very, very close friends. I was still are to this day. Um, uh, he's actually a bit of a family friend. He's been at my house, my, my mother's house for like a Sunday roast dinner and stuff. Um you know, I've I've been over to Philadelphia a few times, and he's been back here a few times, just as as friends. Him and his wife Pam, uh, great people. Um, I and then before COVID hit, anyway, he was due to come here uh, to um, after the whole strong first debacle. Um, he yeah. obviously created his whole DV8 system, and he was due to come here uh, in 
in um, the beginning of or the beginning of the middle of 2019 when COVID hit. Yeah, um, and it was he was due to have um, a TV at start here for Ireland, and it, it you know sold many sold many tickets from all around Europe. Um, but obviously COVID hit, and then we we moved on online. So I done like a one day like course, not a cert, but a one day course on the DVA system there, and then I actually done the DVA cert last last summer of some kind. I think it was o- online um, wow. whenever the world was in shutdown. So yes, I have done it. Um, to cut the long story. <laughs> to cut the long story short, after telling you the long story, um, yeah. yes, I have done it, <laughs> and uh, it's Phil. Phil. Phil is. An unbelievable coach. Um, I, like, I'm not just saying that because he's a close friend, but uh, I, I genuinely mean that. He's like he he is one of the very few coaches who walks the walk and talks the talk, and he's genuine and he's hundred percent. He's top top man, and uh, he's helped. He's, in my opinion, he was one of the he grew strong first to what it was in America. He was yeah. definitely one of the top two or three people within Sean First who grew it, the what it was all in America, especially on the East Coast, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, yeah. so forth. And um, uh, unbelievable coach. Yes, I have done the TVA system. Have you done it yourself? I have, yeah, yeah. The reason, the reason, and I, I agree 1,000% with everything you said about Phil and Pam. They're they are the real deal. They're lovely people. 100%. And, yeah, I did the, I did the DV insert with them. Uh, let's see, it's 2022 now. Uh, September, not last September, but September of uh, 2020. 2020, yes. 2020. Yeah, and uh, had a blast. Man, it was super fun. The, you know, the different kind of start behind the heel start was definitely an adjustment. Double bell was a pain in the ass, though. I will say that it took a little bit. Big ways. Get used to that. <laughs> um, and I, uh, but to your point about Phil, um, man, I can't, I, I lost count of how many times I would, uh, I would post a video on my, my Instagram story and I would do, you know, a uh, one arm push up or a pistol squat or a, a swing or anything. Cause I just 2020, I just kind of tried a little bit of everything. Cause it was just, you know, there was nothing else to do other than train and drink beer and watch movies. <laughs> I think, I think, I think, uh, I think in 20, I think in 2020 people tried, I think people were allowed to try anything they wanted because <laughs> we were under so much control that you just okay. wanted to venture. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I did, <laughs> he did, I did the mediate uh, cert with him, but even prior to that, I had done, I think he did like a one day workshop on the pistol squat. He did a one day workshop on the one arm push up, the one arm one leg push up. And, uh, you know, that obviously was that those were beneficial, but every single time I would post a video on a story, I would, I would just tag him. Um, he would always take the time and not only share it, but he would give me a cue, uh, to work on, uh, you know, little, th- I mean, he helped me with like hand positioning on the push up. You know, my Turkish getup was was uh, had gotten stagnant for a little while. He helped me like move my foot position just slightly, and even before I had even invested in the deviate, you know, workshop, it. Uh, I mean, he just and he can he continues to do so even now, uh, which is which is amazing. And, and he 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 takes the time and he's very thoughtful with the uh, with his responses. So yes, I I love Phil, and uh, I'm fingers crossed. Hopefully, I, I can. I'd love the road trip. I'm hopefully I can head out to his place in August. For their workshop, but uh, we'll see. We'll kind of see how the state of the world is. <laughs> true, true. Are they doing a workshop in August? Yeah, I think they have a. They have in early August. I want to say is, and I might be getting these these reversed, but basically, in I think it's the first weekend of August is their uh, in person one, and then at the end of August is their virtual one, I believe, or it's the other yeah. way around. Um, but I, uh, I had, I had a blast. I'll do the virtual one again. I, I had a blast. Yeah. It's very much worth the investment. Uh, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget whenever I done it. Sorry, I don't yet, but oh, you're good. I was I was very clearly at the time whenever he done it. Um, whenever I done it, the DV cert, the actual certification weekend, it was in American time. Um, and I was very clearly the only Irish person there, or people from this side of the world. Um, but I think it started around about one o'clock, one p.m. my time, but yeah. it didn't end till about one p one a.m. my time. See when it came to about eleven o'clock at night. I was completely zoning out. I didn't have a clue what people were talking about. Um, <laughs> usually that time, it's middle of the night for me, basically. But in saying that, I, w- I would love to do it in person to see what it was actually like. Um, to see what it's like in person and they actually see different people's uh, action and what they're doing and so forth. Because you know yourself, you just can't get that. You just can't replicate that online, that, that, that personal yeah. interaction when you're doing exercise. 
Oh, absolutely. especially especially when there's so much pra- practical nature behind a sort like that. But yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and I, I love. I'm I'm a very I'm a very as you probably figured out. I'm an outgoing person. I love I love interactions. And, uh, but I will say this: the Zoom Zoom has been awesome. You know, Zoom for it's been great for during the shutdowns. And uh, I trained. I'm sure just like you, I trained a bunch of clients. Uh, you know, on Zoom, and it was definitely a great tool for that. But yeah, I'm definitely definitely craving some definitely craving some in person in person uh, interactions. So. And uh, I feel, I, I wish, you know, it's one of those, I wish I could travel back in time and, and have done an, an SFG with Phil, because I'm sure it was just an amazing experience. You know, my, uh, my colleague, Mike Conway, who spoke very highly of me, by the way, and actually works with Kevin at, at the training room, uh, was, uh, was talking about, he had done his, I think his SFG, and then another workshop with Phil and just, just said it was awesome. And I could, I can only imagine, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was freaking sweet. So Awesome, man. Well, you, you are more obviously than just a coach. I wanted to talk to you about training and fitness and all that kind of stuff, but I would definitely love to branch into kind of different topics and have some fun, uh, you know, with this conversation, you know, cause the people that are kettlebell nerds are going to love this stuff, but people not as into it are going to be like, all right, don't run. I don't care. I'm just going to pick this bell up and swing it. But, um, but yeah, so what, uh, what kind of music do you like listening to when you train? <laughs> I feel you've been forced to ask this question with, uh, with Kev, um, <laughs> I definitely, I definitely don't listen to country. That is an absolute certain. I was, I was hoping, I was kind of hoping you, you would say that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do country. Honest. If I hear country, I, I picture myself sitting on someone's porch drinking a, a beer. <laughs> it was so funny because I was sat in my house, my well, my mother's house a couple of weeks back, and um, my brother was sitting there and he was playing the. He, he thinks he can play the guitar, let's just say, but um, he was in the corner, uh, trying to trying to trying to string together a few <laughs> a few notes. But um, yeah. and uh, country came on, and it was Chris Stapleton, and uh, I actually I like one or two of his songs, but it's not for my normal training taste. Um, music ways, it all depends on the mood. To be quite honest, sometimes I come in and I train in the gym with no music on. And I use it as mental space because you're aware, oh. being a coach, all you're dealing with is people on it all the time. And basically, you need time to yourself in this in this industry, especially not only in this industry, but when you're dealing in such a in such a uh, personal interaction, there's a lot of personal communication. You do need time to think it sometimes because you just need to channel your thoughts. But sometimes I would train literally with no music on. Well, uh, when I'm feeling that I just need to kind of like really get into the training, I would listen to a lot of, you know, electrical um, dance music or um, a lot of house music um, and a lot of, uh, yeah, what would you say? Yeah, a lot, a lot of EDM basically. And then some days I would come in and I would listen to Flip Me Mac uh, or I would listen to <laughs> Bob Seger or Love I would it. listen to... Uh, uh, Bruce Hornsby, or I'm I'm 31 by the way, and I'm kind of talking about music here, like like it's like I'm 50. But and uh, hey, we're, the, we're the same age, so I'm I'm uh yeah. I'm everything you're putting down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love Fleetwood Mac. I will I will train really hard to Fleetwood Mac. Like quite honestly, I'm I'm all yeah. about. <laughs> it was so funny in here that in the gym the other day, there's a group here from Belfast called Bicep. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they're massive around Europe. They may, they're, I actually think they're quite big in America as well, to be fair. Um, but they're like an underground house uh, oh, DJ. Cool. So they're, but their music's quite electric and quite, you know, quirky. So that came on the gym the other day. It was quite heavy. And then uh, it shuffled straight into Fleetwood Mac Dreams. And I was just like, whoa, what a, what a contrast. But, uh, <laughs> but um, that's a, it really depends how I feel. Um, and then, some days, yeah, uh, I could just let Spotify um, do its own thing, and you yeah. can come into the gym here, and you could hear Tupac switching into Justin Bieber. You don't know. Love it. <laughs> yeah. so that's me too, man. I, I, my, I have a. So I'm, I'm. You're joking about age. I still use YouTube for music because it's. I love how easy it is to use. I put together playlists on there and it's fun. And uh, all of my clients make fun of me all the time. They say, get on Spotify, which I do use Spotify, but I like listening to podcasts on Spotify. That's the reason I use it. Um, but anyways, I, so yeah, yes, I use YouTube for music. Uh, all the, all the younger kids can make fun of me. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I, I'll, I've actually literally had that same 
uh, contrast. I've gone from like an Eminem song to like a Britney Spears song, which really got into <laughs> Well, I wouldn't go as far as Britney Spears now. Tomorrow, don't be, uh, don't be letting <laughs> yourself down to God. <laughs> okay, no worries. You, that's okay. No worries. All about preference, so. Um, I, I was old, I will say like old Britney, like first few albums that came out when you, know, you and I were you know, kids and uh, still buying CDs and, and doing all that. <laughs> I actually remember the very, the very first CD I bought um, and it was in a local shopping centre and it was for my mother's Christmas present, I'm nearly sure. And it was George Michael, Ultimate Collection. <laughs> awesome, yes. <laughs> I was about, I think I was about 12 years of age and I can, I can remember walking in and to the CD, to the CD shop. I don't even think them things even exist anymore. Um, no, no. Walking into a CD shop and it was this George, I just seen this white CD cover, but it was like pure white it was George Michael's face. I know why he was so sharp with that beard and that like really drastic quiff. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, he's a good looking fella. So I bought that anyway. And uh, it you know, I still to this day believe it's my ma's best uh, Christmas present. That's awesome. No, I love that. <laughs> my, my, my mom loved uh, uh, loved listening to George Michael. She had a bunch of CDs and listened to it. Uh, I mean, it would, those songs would pop up obviously on like the classic rock radio station when I was growing up, and a uh, lot, lot of lot of great memories there. So I uh, no, I love it, man. I love it. That's fantastic. What? Um, so you obviously train coaches. Uh, you train coaches. You train athletes. You train general population military, first responders, which I think is cool. I think it's really neat when you train a wide variety of people because you're, you're going you're gonna to gain a lot of experience and, uh, and exposure and become even better at your craft. What is what does your training currently look like? What kind of stuff are you working on for yourself? So my training on a yearly basis just goes, I base all of my training on the world's, world championships and kettlebell sport on a year. That's, that's, that's where I'm peaking every single year, basically. That's where I'm focusing on. Um, this year I am going to compete in the world championships in at the end of November in Belgium, and that's where I'm going to go for my fourth world title. I've won three already. Uh, I won my I won my first world title in 2016, and then one in 2019, and then one in 2020. Um, and then obviously the sport took a wee bit of a hit there, obviously with as you're aware. But um, I'm going to go and compete this year in the worlds. My that's my overriding goal, really. Uh, training right now is just focusing on that it may come as a bit of a strange one because it's about <laughs> eight months away but ultimately that's the life of an athlete I guess you're kind of peaking for one time a year right now currently my training I train I train six days a week I train for about an hour to about two hours at a time depending on okay. how depending on what where I am in the program or uh, where I am relative to a competition because obviously you have competitions throughout the course of the year that you're using as uh, miniature tests before going to it but I I three days kettlebell three days barbell uh, and a slight bit of endurance work um, I have utilized that that very simple layout for the past I would say seven years or so in terms of my own training uh, barbell ways it's always funny um, talking about this coming from a kettlebell background of course barbell training ways I I, literally three days a week for the past six or seven years I've been doing back squat deadlift uh, bench press or multi press and pull ups um, and or dips basically that's the only real barbell work I, 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 I do um, and for an endurance athlete um, I find I have pretty pretty good standards in that you know if I, I have a 165 back squat at 80 kilo I have a 190 deadlift at 80 kilo um, nice. I uh, can press a 40 kg kettlebell for five five reps, which is half my body weight. Um, Impressive, man! That's awesome. Pull ups, pull ups, pull ups are my nemesis because I have arms the length of a bald eagle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I makes it tougher, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, um, kettlebell training, it, it it really all depends on what I'm doing relative to the competition. So right now I'm competing in pentathlon. Um, what's what's a kettlebell pentathlon? It is where Five exercises are combined. Um, you have the kettlebell clean, kettlebell clean and press, jerk, half snatch, and push press. Six minutes per event, five minutes recovery. Uh, weights can vary from exercise to exercise, but uh, and what I do there is I complete as many reps as I can within six minutes. Um, and well, you're only allowed to complete a certain amount of reps per 
six minutes in each event, but you can change the weights. And for example, if I clean a 40 kg in the, in the kettlebell clean section of the pentathlon, I, uh, for every one rep, you'll get like four or five, you get 4.5 points where if I was to clean a 24, I would get like 2.5 points. Gotcha. So once you, once you, it's obviously advantageous to go heavier on the pentathlon so that you can actually accumulate a higher points total. And like I said earlier, whenever I was going into the detail about kettlebell sport, obviously the ha- the, the, point, the person with the highest reps and has points wins. Um, but like, um, I, I whenever I whenever I started kettlebell training um, back in two thousand like sorry gear voice sport kettlebell training back in two thousand and fifteen, I entered into it via just the, the 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 raw nature of it in terms of biathlon, which is the jerk and the snatch combined, um, and that's how I got into it. So and that's how I, that's actually how I won my first world title in in Kazakhstan in two thousand and sixteen. In the Kazakhstan? Was in, oh, that's in really Kazakhstan. Cool. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, in that's awesome. In 2016, that I had 18 months experience. Um, so, like, what actually happened here? I'm, going to, I'm probably going off on a bit of a tangent here, but in 2015, I before that, um, I was competing heavily in running in in middle distance and cross country running, and I had very respectable times. Not to be fair, you know, I had I, I had a 32 k a 32 minute 10 k. I had a 15 minute 35 k. Uh, also. I also have a 240 marathon under my belt. Not bragging or anything, but, you know, I come from a heavy endurance background. Back away, um, man. I love it. I love hearing people's numbers. I, you're, so, you have blown me out of water in my, my prime uh, cross <laughs> So, um, but in, in 2015, I was a bit of a crossroads with my training in general. Um, and I just decided to enter in the world of kettlebell sport. I'm not going to detail how it happened, but, you know, yeah. since that year, you know, I've um, achieved the greatest, it's greatest of accolades in the sport, um, winning multiple Irish titles, alongside achieving the impossible uh, and becoming the first Irish person, the first Irish person to win the Irish, European and World Kettlebell Championships all in one year with only 18 uh, months of kettlebell sports specific training. Um, yeah. What was even more, what was even more lethal about winning that world title was uh, this five foot seven, at the time, 66 kilo Irish man rocked up in Kazakhstan and beat three Kazakhs and three Russians at their own sport in their own backyard. Um, so I oh, was absolutely loving life. Um, yeah. uh, it was probably beneficial for me to get out of that country very soon anyway. But uh, <laughs> but um, so that's basically where I won my world titles was predominantly in, in biathlon. But yeah. last year, or sorry, a year and a half ago, the, the side of sport, which people don't talk about a lot of, is injuries. Because you know yourself, um, or at least you're, I'm assuming you're aware anyway, that sport and competing in any athletic endeavor is unhealthy. Um, and it's an unfortunate truth. Yeah. But injuries are part and parcel of competing in a sport. I don't care what anybody else says. Uh, you, you do get people say, oh, obviously, obviously you shouldn't get injured. You don't want to get injured. But ultimately, when you're competing in a sport, it is the trade off that you are running the risk of being injured a, a lot. And Last year and a half ago, I I had in the space of like four or five months, my body just it just broke down drastically. Um, and I remember I've been doing, I've been through, I I have been religiously training on average anyway. Obviously, have daily weeks, six days a week for two for an hour to two hours every single day for the past you know five to eight years in kettlebell training. So yeah. um, my body took its toll. I in the space of four months, I had a I had a minor tear in my right hamstring. I had a minor tear in my left rotator cuff. I also um, rupture. I, I had a slight rupture in one of my obliques. From this is all from kettlebell training, from from doing kettlebell sport. And remember, whenever I was training kettlebells at the time, doing biathlon, your training was very sport specific. So all you were doing were double jerks and snatch, yeah. three days a week, all the time. Um, so you can imagine the strain you're putting on your body. So. Uh, hit hit with, a, hit with a few injuries and just kind of really broke me mentally. And I needed, and I was at the time, I was going, I was going right. I'm stepping away. I need to kind of look after my health here. But um, I did step away for about two months and just trained, um, doing what I could around the injuries. Um, and it gave me actually some time to have some thinking that what I wanted to do because I'm a very competitive person. I love just um, putting myself 
into the Hurt Locker and, and then the pentathlon, the, the pentathlon came about. Um, that that it came about as in it was something like just kind of happened there and then. It, the the uh, pentathlon was created by Valerie Vatarenko, who's like one of the G's of uh, kettlebell sport, basically. Yeah. He's like, he's like to kettlebell sport what Pavel is to Harstey. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, he created the uh, he created the, the pentathlon many 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 years ago, and there was an opportunity to compete in uh, an online European Championships um, for Ireland. So I was like, so I just went fuck it, let's do it. Um, and then I went and actually on the first competition in pentathlon, I set a world record in my weight category, and I set the highest points total across all weight classes. And I was like, fuck me, I am lethal at this. So. Uh, <laughs> so Ever since then, I've I've, uh, I've stuck at it. Um, it's actually quite good because doing just two exercises in terms of kettlebell training, the jerk and the snatch, specific to the sport that I was competing in, it can't take us toll mentally. And going from that to doing five exercises was almost like a new lease of life. So it's kind of kind of give me a lot a lot more variety to my training. So yeah, um, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but hopefully it makes all sense. But so I love it. basically yeah. three, three days kettlebells, three days barbells. Um, my uh, the kettlebell season doesn't start until usually around the middle of the summertime, so uh, I'm not competing until I'm not competing until July, and then after that, then it's just all I run until the worlds. Um, and that's where I'm going uh, to uh, Belgium to compete in the worlds for Ireland. And um, I'll go there, I'll win the world championships, I'll set a world record officially, and I will uh. Fingers crossed, achieve the highest the highest rank possible within kettlebell sport, and that's master sport international class. Um, I have I have unofficially hit the numbers equivalent to actually achieve that, but because, unofficially because they're not in person competition, they're competitions online. Um, yeah, and they're yeah. and they're, I've I've done them in competitions that, that that are not internationally ranked. They're just local competitions. Sure. Um, so to go and do it on the world stage will be will be. Proper gangster. That's awesome, man. I love. I love. That. I, I love. Uh, I love the fact that you have a good, healthy dose of. You have confidence, but it's you. you you've done it before, you know, in regards to winning the world championships. So you you know you can physically do it. You've hit those numbers that you just that you just talked about when you hit, you know, at the in person competition. So that's that's cool, man. That's so. I, I might. I I don't know if I'll say this very often because I have a I have a thirteen month old daughter at home. Uh, I'm not at home right now, but but uh, I fuck I am lethal at this. That might have to be my mantra for myself when when the when the workouts are getting stuff. Just remind myself that it's uh It's so it's, funny uh, because I because I train a few guys from I train a few guys from America and I train a few guys from Canada, um, both online. And yeah. uh, it took it took those guys a while to understand some of the Irish, especially the Belfast lingo and how I kind of say some things, but. If you if you speak to Kev, apparently he is basically talking pure Belfast in Boston in his gym in the training room. Am I right? It's called the training room. Training room. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So he's going there apparently, and he's t- he's he's telling me that some of the Americans are just like, "What are you talking, Kev?" Um, he's, yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah. But I love it. Oh, I think it's awesome. No, I dig it, and it's it's cool to see that that influence uh, the influence that you're having on him reach, you know, his colleagues and, and clients and coaches at, at his gym, you know, all the way across the pond. So that's, uh, man, that's awesome stuff. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more in regards to, I obviously, my competition experience is nowhere near yours. I've done a couple TSCs, you know, with, uh, with Strong First. And I, um, I'm currently training for Sinister right now and uh, about, to, about to give it a go. I'm actually testing on Tuesday. And uh, we're going to see, we're going to see how, see where I'm at. And Where are you at? Where, where, do, you, where, do, you, where do you feel you're at? I, I feel that I'm there actually. I we've been doing uh, so, we're, and we're doing it with the 48k. I actually I did simple. Simple didn't take too long to do because I had the background in, in SFG and, and the training, and that obviously helped a lot. Particularly the double bell work with double 24 has definitely helped me prepare. And uh, but yeah, no, I mean we did 32, 36, 40, 44, and a- actually as the weights have gone up, I've actually it's been in some ways easier because you mentioned it earlier that that relationship between uh, tension and relaxation. I've, I've been able to learn how to use enough power to get the bell up to height, but not overexert, which is very easy to do in the hard style uh, world. You think everything's got to be max out full effort, but, um, but it's just funny hearing you talk about the events and, you know, you're doing, you know, six minutes here, 10 minutes there, and 
you know, I'm, I'm just doing five minutes of swings. It's, you know, in, in comparison, it's funny how different yeah. those are. You have to put perspective on things though, DeMarco. Um, and I can relate to what you're going through as well, because I was the exact same whenever I started my, my kettlebell journey in the kettlebell sport. I came from a horror state background. Yeah. I just loved doing kettlebell snatches and just doing uh, kettlebell presses. Still do them, obviously, of course, but in a, in a different nature. But yeah, uh, but it's I, I totally get where you're coming from. I, I understand the position you're in and you're doing it relative to your goals. So it's 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 also no surprise that you're feeling that easier as you go along because you're also getting physically stronger and also uh, physically more enduring relative to those two exercises because you're doing them for so often. So, you know, that said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, yeah, you're getting absolutely. good at it by doing it more often. Um, it's a funny thing, that, isn't it? Um, people always say, how do I get good at one thing? Uh, how about doing the actual thing and getting good at it in the first place? That's how you get good at it. But um, yeah. so... But no, it's 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 you're in this. You're probably in the exact same position as Kev. Kev was like, "How did I get into kettlebell sport?" It's one of those things. You just have to reach out to somebody who is who has a background in it yeah. and go and give it a try. It's kind of one of those things. You just kind of got to take it off your box if you want to do it. Do it. And I'll, me and I can talk for many other kettlebell sport athletes out there and coaches. If you don't want to do it. Hold no grudge. Um, see, at the yeah. end of the day, I find it so I find it so strange um, that there's. I don't know if you can see it, but there is this stigma attached to kettlebell sport, um, and there is even a stigma from kettlebell sport attached to ca- the horse like kettlebell training. But ultimately, you're fighting over a piece of metal, um, and <laughs> people are being political about a, about yeah. an exercise, a piece of exercise equipment. Yeah. See, at the end of the day. See, the only thing that's winning is the person who is physically increasing their strength, their power, their life expectancy, and yeah. also their athleticism by training on a daily basis. See Absolutely. if somebody wants to bang their head off a wall, and um, not necessarily, obviously, I'm not advocating that, but if somebody wants to kind of put themselves in the hurt locker and go and compete in kettlebell sport, fair fucks to you. If somebody wants to do um, simple and sinister, and they're getting, ben- they're getting benefits out of it, yeah. Same again. Fair fucks to you. Keep her lit. You know, so exactly. um, everybody has their own thing to do. Um, and at the end of the day, as I always say, and it doesn't, I don't mean to sound cheesy, but the only thing that's winning here is the kettlebell because everyone's using it. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, and I, I love that. I love, uh, I know I've, I'm repeating myself, but I don't care. I think this is a great theme. <laughs> keep hammering away. I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're confident in yourself, you're confident in your method and your system, um, but you're always, you're always willing to listen to, you know, other opinions. You have an open mind and you understand like I do that this, you know, kettlebell, these kettlebells behind me uh, and probably behind you at your place as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to use them. There's a lot of really, really great ways to use them, and they're not exactly the same, and that's okay. You know, if you're if you're picking it up safely, you're getting stronger, you're building your work capacity, and you're in your mind, you know, and body, you're becoming a stronger version of yourself. Then let's do it, and that's awesome. And whether or not you compete or don't compete, I have clients that love the they love doing the training for like a TSC, but they don't want to compete in a TSC because they don't want the pressure. They just want to have fun and work out and train hard and get the results, but they don't want a bunch of people watching them. And as their coach, I'm not going to push them to do something that they don't want to do uh, because that's, that's just, that's not my job. It's my job to, to serve them. So if they want to compete, awesome. But I love the fact that you're very much, uh, it's an option for people, but you're not saying, Hey, listen, you're really good at this. You should compete at GS. And you Absolutely not. No, no, so, no. And see, see, to be honest, the Marco also see no matter the implement, and no matter the methods, there are, at the end of the day, anyone's, any person's training session should always put them on the path towards their goal, not our goal for them as, as their coach. As Dan John always says, being a good coach is finding the balance between what that person wants and what that person needs. If that person wants to do kettlebell sport, it might not necessarily be the thing that they need to do and vice versa. But, yeah. um, and no matter what, Again, if you don't mind me going off on a wee bit of a one here, but whether it be horse style or kettlebell, whether it be horse style kettlebell training or kettlebell sport, tra- kettlebell sport style training, or me as a coach, um, if somebody comes to me and they want to train kettlebell sport, for example, and or they want to they come to me and they want to train horse horse style kettlebell training, um, uh, or they want to train barbell training, 
I have three primary methods that I always focus on. Um, and th the three are, one, training sessions need to be repeatable. Two, your training sessions should put you on the path towards your goal. And training sessions should always focus on quality. Those are basically the three methods behind anybody getting from point A to point B. Um, do you mind if I go into them in a little bit of detail? Oh, not at all. No, keep going. I no, no. So in terms of this, this is where this is where I like to talk about this because um, I'll go into a bit of detail on this. So number one, training sessions need to be repeatable. I I have joked, <laughs> I've joked a few times about a training session that I did um, in July of 2017. Here's here's the workout. Now, this wasn't like a workout that I just done randomly one day. I my my barbell coach had me train towards this. Um, so this is what it was: ten back squats at 100 kilo, 15 squats at 95 kilo, and 20 squats at 90 kilo. Seven sets of that, 350 reps, 315 reps total, 30,000 kilo to lift it in one workout. Oh my here's god! The truth, Mar here's the truth, Demarco. I'm still recovering, right? <laughs> so, so you see, so you see, see at this time, I was at the peak of my training with the back squat. I also went on to win the European Championships in Portugal, but that session was that session w wasn't repeatable. I crashed emotionally and physically for a very long time after that. Yeah, obviously oh, because I, I reached, just thinking about that <laughs> because I reached the peak, obviously. But okay, some people will t like some people will say. Um, the crash is just part of the price, but for the bulk of people who I coach, I fully believe that training often, consistent with sustained progress, is a much better goal. Um, and I believe the majority of people who are successful in their own fit, on their own health and fitness um, and sporting careers, is simply down to them continuing to come back to the gym uh, or back to their sport and and regularly getting the work done i.e. training sessions need to be repeatable. Then you have number two, uh, training sessions should put you on the path of progress towards your goal. Um, I, I, I honestly can't believe until I'm saying that, but it, it is 100% true. See the number of people who reach out to me, um, athletes um, or just general population, struggling, struggling to find success in their goals. It's made me realize one thing that most people haven't got a clue. Ultimately, that's why they come to us. Um, people, you, you probably get these questions too. People will be like, if I do plyometrics every day, will it make me jump higher? You know, will achieving a 100 kg bench press allow me to tackle harder in the sport, for example? Will, yeah, yeah. will, 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 will doing bent over rows and pull ups make me achieve a better kilometer time on the concept two roar? You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> it's crazy, but you know, all, all these little drills and lifts that people invent in the gym. Relative to your sport, they they usually lead you, they usually lead to injury. So, yeah. in my opinion, people never realize that because people never realize that because you can do this and that doesn't mean you should. You know, if you can improve your performance through general basic training alone, why would you waste your time on all the all other stupid stuff? You know, majority yeah. of the time, and the majority majority of the time, and the most overlooked method for the best way to get better at something is by doing that something. Again, training sessions to put you on the path towards your goal. And then thirdly, uh, training sessions should always focus on quality. Um, an important point, and I learned this from Pavel, Pavel Satsaline, anybody can destroy, anybody can design a workout to destroy you. You know, yes. simple, you know, get up and give me a thousand push-ups, a thousand bodyweight squats, and a thousand swings. Trust me, you'll be fucked. Um, never, yes. <laughs> never, never, never confuse Never confuse working out with training. Obviously, there is a time to train your limits, to exceed your limits, but most of the time, uh, just focus on quality because ultimately, quality has always been king in both fitness and sport performance. So there's my, there's my three my three bit, bits of uh, wisdom in terms of methods. One, training sessions need to be repeatable. Two, training sessions should put you on the path of progress towards your goal. And three, training sessions should always focus on quality. Well, damn, man, that's a that's a mic drop moment. I, uh, I <laughs> there's no other way to say this than uh, that I absolutely fucking love that. Uh, I'm I'm going to clip out part of this and put this on a separate video, probably on my Instagram page as well as on YouTube on a, as a separate clip because I if I would have heard that my first year as a coach, 
I, I, there are a lot of silly mistakes I would have avoided. So I, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. That, that's great stuff, man. And I, I just, I love your philosophy on coaching and training. And I, uh, actually, I, this, I'm actually in, in my friend's, uh, soon to be open fitness studio now where, uh, he's got a, he's got to iron out a couple more details, but I'm going to see if I can convince him to get us to print it out and uh, put it on the wall. Don't worry. We'll quote you as a, re- we'll, we'll cite, I cite my sources. I always cite it in the format. So you'll, you'll be, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll take a picture of you doing a, one of your, your movements and, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, Finn, I, I gotta tell you, man, I, I love this conversation. And if I didn't have another guest coming on in about 20 minutes, I would just keep going and say, screw it. Let's go. Um, so I'm not that popular yet. Uh, but I, uh, I think you, you're, an, I love, I just love your approach to life and lifting and everything. And uh, I think, uh, I think my, my viewers, particularly the coaches and lifters, just people looking to train and improve themselves will, will get a lot of great wisdom, you know, from everything that you've said today. And the one thing I did want to end on before we, before we shut this down is uh, where can people find you? Uh, in particular, obviously online on social media, and if they want to, uh, if they want to reach out to you to do your Irish Warrior program training or your uh, your kettlebell essentials ebook, I forgot to mention that earlier. Okay, so firstly, the, uh, before we get into that, I just want to say thanks for obviously inviting me on, Demarco. It's been good getting the chat and obviously talking a bit about my background and so forth. So I appreciate that. And yes, if you want to, if you want to find um, me on social media. Uh, What's that? Uh, your handle <laughs> uh, yeah, on yeah. Instagram? On Instagram, it's just uh, Finbar Tulin at Finbar Tulin, um, or at Virtue Gym Belfast, which is my gym. Uh, I do everything through social media there. Um, I'm actually in the process of creating. Um, they'll be launched in a couple of weeks' time. My websites and stuff for all of my products and that, but they're all being finalized. So, just reach out to me on my on on Instagram at Finbar Tulin. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to link all of this below in the description on uh, both platforms, on YouTube and on Spotify. So people, I'll make sure, I'll double check and make sure I spell it properly so that people find <laughs> the person. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can't say this, I can't say this enough. I, I had a total blast with you, man. I think this was, I think this was a great conversation. And it, uh, you, I, I kind of feel like, uh, not that I'm painting you as a villain, but I definitely kind of feel as if I'm, I'm a young, uh, Anakin Skywalker and, and you're you're the emperor and you're bringing me over to the to the dark side. <laughs> because after after Sinister Man, my, my goal, Dan John, I'm I'm following Dan John's rule, you know, keep the goal the goal. But you know, after Always. Sinister, I definitely want to get into more varieties of movement. I do love swing and get up. I'll probably always do them or some variation, but I definitely uh, will be thinking about the next challenge. And I think it might have to be GS. I think you've kind of you've kind of sold me on it in a <laughs> So, um, we can definitely. I'll, I'll, we won't take time on this podcast, but I'll, I'll I'll send you some messages and we can we can talk about that. Absolutely, absolutely. You know where I am. In the line. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate your time. Do you have a corny dad joke to to end us off with? Um, I it's it's a bit strange actually because as you're aware, I'm not a father just yet, but uh, I will I will I'll say one, and this is something that probably are you married. I am. Yeah, I'm married and I have a, I have a baby girl again. Yeah, so you're probably, you can probably relate to this. So my wife, she yelled at me the other day and she says to me, are you even listening to me? And I says, that's a funny way to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love that. I, love that. I was going to, I was going to say an Irish one, but uh, we'll keep it very, very common because uh, the most, of, most of the time that I'm sitting there with my wife, uh, I'm looking into the complete oblivion. And she's in one ear, and what she's saying is going directly at the other. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's 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 just the truth. <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean, and trust me, I, I can totally relate. And it's it's so funny how uh, and you mentioned, and to be honest, and to be fair, you did mention this earlier. Like as coaches, we spend our, our entire day talking to people, engaging, um, we're coaching, we're hearing, we're assessing. We're, there's a lot. There's a lot going on up here where you may yeah. not see it externally, but internally, there's a lot going on. Uh, and I'm the same way. I, I need that. I need that downtime as well. I, I remember this isn't really a dad joke. This is just a funny random story to end on. But I, uh, I remember when I, my, so my wife's a physician right now. She's a, a resident. She's going through a psychiatry residency. And uh, so she is way smarter than I am. It's not even funny. I'm, I'm, <laughs> um, don't, let her, don't, 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 don't let her, don't let her win that one on the DeMarco. Make sure, you, uh, make sure you don't tell her that either. Yeah, seriously, seriously. <laughs> but she, uh, so she, 
before she went to medical school, she was a teacher. She taught for a couple of years and uh, th there was a brief period of time where, uh, and she's always just been a really hard worker. She's always worked hard, just, just a hard charger, which is one of the many things that I love about her. She's uh, yeah, she's a badass. But, but anyway, she, she finished teaching in, you know, summer, you know, beginning of summer. And for that period of time until I want to say September, probably August, September. So for a good two to three months, she, she wasn't working. I was working. I was full-time coach training, you know, getting up, doing those 5 a.m. sessions and, you know, training until seven or eight at night, split shift and all that. And I would get home and we didn't have kids at the time. You know, we, it was just the two. And actually that time we weren't even married yet. Uh, but we were, you know, it was just the two of us didn't have any pets. And she was just so stir crazy from the entire day. Uh, and as soon as I got home, it was just like a, like a sitcom. Uh, she would come to the door and just, <laughs> and just explode like words and words and words and words. I just have everything to tell me. Uh, and I, and the first couple of times, I, like, I was just like, oh my gosh. The third time I walked and I said, hang on a second, hang on a second. And I sat out on our porch for like five minutes just to have silence, uh, just to kind of relax and literally just sit there and do nothing. Uh, and then, and then I went in and, and, uh, and then I went in and would talk to her. And then we very quickly realized it's good that she was going back to school because she needs to be busy. <laughs> not your, 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 your quintessential stay at home uh, uh, wife. <laughs> she, she, needs, uh, she needs to be busy uh, yeah. not talking to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I, I know, when we go, when we go out to eat, if, if we go out to somewhere like a, like if it's a, you know, a place with televisions with sports on the big joke is like, we, she always positions me to where my back is to the TV because it's just that 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 male brain. If any sport is on, it could be curling, like something I don't know anything oh, about. I'm gonna start watching. Brutal. <laughs> and, uh, and like you said, in, in one ear and out the other. So, but I, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't relate more. Well, Finn, I man, I really appreciate your time, brother. I am definitely Likewise. gonna reach out to you. For would love to talk to you about GS. I'm going to link everything below so people can find you and uh, hopefully connect with you uh, on coaching and everything. And whether it's me coming to Ireland or you coming back <laughs> at some point, let's definitely get together. Let's share a, share a cold one, talk training. and uh, Absolutely. Good man. I appreciate it, DeMarco, 100%. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I want to thank all of you so much for watching. And you know, I hope you got a lot of great uh, wisdom and knowledge from this, uh, from this conversation with Finn. Uh, you know, we are here to help you become your strongest self and have fun along the way. And uh, as always, remember to train your body and feed your mind.